Hi, I'm Rick Plummer. I do a one-man play called Live from the Front, Byline, Ernie Pyle. I've been touring it around the country since 2002, and I'll be doing excerpts of it here at Dixon. So um, I fell in love with Ernie because my dad was a World War II combat veteran. And uh, he would never talk about his experiences, but he did give me Ernie Pyle's books, and I read them. They meant something to me as a child, but it was only after I got back from my two years in Vietnam that I appreciated just why Dad found it so difficult to talk about his combat. I love that old Ernie guy. He was quite beloved. Uh, syndicated in 200 dailies, 300 weeklies. I had over 40 million readers before he was killed on that little atoll right off of Okinawa on the 18th of April, 1945. From a little town named Dana, Indiana. And I love what he says about the GI. He says, I reckon you know I'm not just partial to the infantry man. Hell, I'm a rabid one man movement bent on tracking down, stamping out everybody in the world doesn't appreciate the common foot soldier. I look at here. A frontline soldier lives for months like an animal. He eats if he can, when he can, sleeps on hard ground or in watery foxholes. His clothes are filthy, greasy, dirty. He's moving constantly. Lives in a constant haze of mud, dust, pestered by flies, lice, heat, cold. I, you know, I was going to add a word or two to my second book as a kind of memorial to the first one. And, well, I was looking for a line from that first book, and here it is. I heard of a high British officer who went over a battlefield just after an action, and this tough British soldier looked at those young American boys still lying dead in their foxholes, their rifles still grasped in the firing position in their dead hands. This tough British officer whispered time and again in a sort of hushed eulogy. Good morning. I'd like to start out our day with the live from the front, starring Rick Plummer in a one-hand drama, byline of Ernie Pyle. I'll let him take it away. Well, I reckon you know I'm not just partial to the infantry man. Hell, I'm a one-man movement. Been on tracking down, stamping out everybody in the world that appreciates common foot soldiers. Look here, frontline soldier lives for months like an animal. He eats if he can, when he can. Sleeps on hard ground or in watery foxholes. His clothes are filthy, greasy, worn. He's deprived of all things that once meant stability, things like walls and chairs and floors and windows and ceilings. And in a little manner of knowing, he's going to bed at night in the same place he left. Now, my tour of the foxholes began a little over a year ago, and at least this chapter of it. In June 43, the military began assigning war correspondents to the Sicilian invasion. They dreamed of the South and the country not to tip off the enemy by some mass exodus. We couldn't even wire our offices, let our bosses know where we're going or when we're going. I hope they had the good sense to assume that we were just open on the job as usual, not dead or kidnapped by Abraham's. I was assigned a ship. She was out of anchor and harbor, so I went over right away. I saw she was a mighty important ship to the USS Biscayne headquarters ship on the top brass. Now, I reckon you heard the one about the sailor who was asked, what do you do if an enlisted man fell overboard? Well, well, sir, he said, we sound a man overboard, I go back and fish him out of the drink. And then that sailor was asked, what he knew if it was an officer? Well, that sailor thought, thought, and then he said, um, well, which officer? Now, I felt right at home on board that ship, despite all those officers, because she also carried some plain old troops. Every soldier spent the first few hours on board exactly the same way. Took a wonderful shower bath, sat at a table, drank water with ice in it, drank coffee out of a porcelain cup, ate food with real silverware. After 
Summer Supper, what I watched to the movie, read current magazines, and finally got into bed with a real mattress on it. And we kept bubbling our appreciation until finally the Navy got sick of our juvenile delight over things that used to be commonplace. Hell, they even had ice cream and Coca-Cola. Yes, sir. These sailors was the first violent action for them. And I know they went to the battle the same way a soldier goes into his first action, outwardly calm, but inside, frightened, sick. It's just the last few days before starting out seems to hit so hard. I mean, in the preparation period, fate seems far away. Once in battle, a man's too busy to be scared. It's just those last few hours when there's time to think too much. That fear, I call it, the awful dread. Well, sir, one night before we sailed, I was sitting on the forward decks helping a bunch of sailors liberate a scrounged can of pineapple. And they asked me what I thought our chances were. Oh, well, boys, I don't know that. Well, I'll tell you, the way I look at her is, if your number's up, it's up. And if it's not, you're going to come through just fine. Safety. I never heard anybody say anything particularly patriotic along the way they got it in movies. And there was philosophizing, but it was simple and undramatic. You know, I don't think one of those fellows would have stayed back even if he had given a chance. No, sir. There was something bigger in him than his fear that was in the dream. In me, it was probably some irresistible egoism, maybe, seeing myself part of some historic naval movement. But with the others, he was just plain, unspoken, unrecognized patriotism. At night before we sailed, the crew listened as usual to the German propaganda radio. Mitch, the American girl, her Nazi. Boys nicknamed her Olga. She sure worked hard at her job. She said, uh, your sweethearts will marry someone else while you're overseas fighting the phony war for the Jewish Roosevelt. And we'll get a job waiting for you when you get home. Oh, boys, uh, as I say, you came to old and she had to come in her voice. Every night I hear the fellas conjecture about what she looked like. Now, some of them thought she's probably a old hag with a fat face and rock side hair. But most of them like to visualize her just as beautiful as she sounds. strikes a new country is called E-Day, and the hour at his beach is called H-Hour. For the 3rd Infantry Division, H-Hour was set for 2.45 a.m. E-Day, Sicily. Now, paratroopers and rangers were there on the beach before, and far down the beach to our right, two other large American forces hit the beach about the same time we did. We knew when they landed for the shooting for an hour or so into the assault. And by the end of the first day, we looked around with awe and alarm. It had been so easy. We had the jumpy feeling something was dreadfully wrong somewhere. Instead of the thousands of passengers on the 14 mile front of our sector, the number was small. My weeks with the Navy have been grand, but strangely, I hear that old soldier from being asleep out on the ground, not washing before breakfast, biting off fleas. Man, he's a funny creature. Now behind me is a distinguished and unbroken record of getting sick in every country I ever visited. So I figured I might as well go ahead and get sick right away in Sicily. 
my fifth day ashore, they threw me in the back of an ambulance and we set off. We were looking for a clearance station, a certain hospital, but we couldn't find her. Because as we were moving forward, it was moving back and vice versa. So we kept passing on dusty gravel roads. We drove 75 agonizing miles and finally found that hospital, all set up, ready for business, just four miles from where we started out. Uh, this clearance station was a small Kent hospital of the 45th division. What I had was common illness called battlefield fever. Now, a fellow didn't die of battlefield fever, but he sure thinks he's a goat. High temperature, aches all over. The docs think it's caused by too much exhaustion, not enough sleep. Bad eating and the unconscious tension that comes to everybody in the front lines. So, as I lay there in one of five small pits where the men were deposited on litters, I heard him talking. One of them said, Well, I reckon I'm going to make her. And another asked, Are they got any beds in this hospital? Lord, how I want to go to bed. And another wincing in pain for the deep probing for a piece of very shrapnel deep in his leg cried out, Go ahead! Go to the dock, I can take it. And another seeing a friend across the way shouted out, Well, I reckon I'll have to write the old lady tonight and tell her. Tell her she missed out on that $10,000 insurance money again. <laughs> you know, these boys from the 45th Division were Boys, I never realized there's such a difference between parts of the country until I bumped into these fellas. These fellas from the plains were soft, smoking and drawing, not smart Alex, something of the purity of the soil, am I right? Well, sir, they weren't so bad before they went into battle, but I don't know All the Germans were SOB. So as I lay there, dying men were gone into our camp. Conversation hushes and made us quiet, thoughtful. The man who almost gone surgeons to replace his paws over his face. Oh, he could still see, but we couldn't see his face. The fellow's time haunted me for days, that's still haunted me. The wounded boy that was semi-conscious, the chaplain knelt by his knee and said, Now, John, I'm going to say a prayer for you. And it was obvious that he meant the final prayer. Well, that started to ask me, hit me like a hammer when he said, Now, John, you're doing fine, you're doing just fine, and he dashed off. I mean, that young boy was left utterly alone. Lying there on that litter on the ground. And it was the, uh, the last few minutes of that boy's life to torment me. I mean, uh, I felt like going over there and at least holding his hand while he died. But I didn't. How much time I had. Why didn't I do that, huh? Well, men in battle reach a stage of an exhaustion that is incomprehensible to you folks back home. Now, take the first infantry, for instance. They were in the front lines for 28 days. Walked in and fighting that entire time. 28 days! Have you ever in your entire life worked so long or so hard? You couldn't remember when you ate last, or you saw your best friend, you didn't recognize him? During that long, hard fight around Troina, a company runner came slogging up to a certain officer and said, I gotta find Pat Anderson right away, important message. And the officer looked at him and said, Well, I'm Pat Anderson, don't you recognize me? And the soldier said, No, 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 no I gotta find Pat Anderson, he dashed off! They'd run to catch him. Men in battle reach that stage and I still go on. It's 
It is the perpetual choking dust, the muscle rack and hard ground, the snatch food, the dirty feet, constant roar of engines, the perpetual movement and never settling down, the go, 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 night and day and on through the night again, until eventually it all works itself into an emotional tapestry, one dull dead time. That war in Italy was tough. The land of the weather both against us. It rained constantly. People fall down, bridges washed out. But the country was shockingly beautiful and just as shockingly difficult to capture. The hills rose to high ridges of almost solid rock and we couldn't go around them through the flat, peaceful valleys below. Hell no, Germans up there that let us have it so we had to go up and over. A mere platoon of Germans We'll go in on some rock spine hill to hold out against tremendous onslaughts. Yeah. I wrote about one of those outfits. Uh, I reckon you know they gave me the Pulitzer this year. Maybe you read this one. For a while, I hung on one of the mule pack outfits I wrote. There was an average of one of these outfits for every battalion in the mountains, the pack outfit I was with. Slide a battalion fighting on a bald, rocky ridge nearly 4,000 feet high. The battalion fought constantly for 10 days and nights. And when the wind finally came down, less than a third of them were left. I have known a lot of officers in my day who were loved and respected by the soldiers under them, but never have I crossed the trail of any man as beloved as Captain Henry T. Moscow, Belton, Texas. Captain Moscow was a company commander in the 36th Division. He was young, only in his middle 20s, but he carried in him a sincerity and a gentleness that made people want to be guided by him. After my father, he comes next, an old sergeant told me. He always looks after us, the soldier said. He goes to bat for us every time. I've never known him to do anything unfair. I was in betrayal the night that brought Captain Moscow down. The moon was nearly full, and you could see far up the trail and even partway across the valley below. Soldiers made shadows in the moonlight as they walked. Dead men have been coming down that mountain all evening lashed onto the backs of mules. They came lying belly down across wooden pack saddles, their heads hanging down on one side, their stiffened legs sticking out awkwardly from the other, bobbing up and down as the mules walked. I don't know who the first one was. You feel small in the presence of dead men and you don't ask silly questions. Two men unlashed a body from the mule and said, this one is Captain Moscow. And lifted it off and laid it in the shadow beside the wall. And other men took other bodies off. And finally there were five lying end to end. You don't cover up bodies in combat zone. They just lie there until somebody comes to collect them. The unburdened mules moved off and the men in the road seemed reluctant to leave. They stood around gradually. I could see them moving one by one close to Captain Waskow's body. Not so much to look, I think, but as to say something in finality to him and to themselves. I stood close by and I could hear. One soldier came and looked down and cried out loud, Damn! That's all he said. He walked away. And another came and he said, Damn the hell anyway. He looked down for a few minutes, turned and left. And another man came, I think it was an officer. The man looked down into the dead captain's face and spoke directly to him as though he were alive. I'm sorry, old man. And a soldier came and stood beside the officer and bent over and also spoke to his dead captain, not in a whisper, but awfully tenderly. I sure am sorry, sir. Then the first man squatted down and reached over and hit me straight in the points 
but it has been shirt collar and sort of rearranged the edges of the uniform around the wound. That man wrapped his hand in his own and sat there for a long time. Little 
shoes pointing towards that country he had come so far to see you and which he saw so briefly i have been 29 months overseas since this war began i've written over 700,000 words about it more popular now than ever do to with me over 40 million readers but I tell you, the war has become a flat, black depression without highlights, a revulsion of the... When I lie in my bed all the night and I think, and I think, and I think, all of the newly dead come crashing on me like some, so many bodies. Bodies lie in ditches, floating in rivers, burned in bunkers, buried in snow, dismembered in minefields, literally blown up in the trees. Heaven, I think if I hear one more shot, for us, one more dead boy, I'm going to go right off my back. I got one more invasion to make. Boys over in the Pacific. Oh, I know. I've always thought the worst. I knew I was going to buy it first in North Africa, Sicily, Normandy. But this time it's going to be different. This next invasion, absolutely my last one. Well, I better get going. So I'll see all you fine folks. In the funny papers. <laughs> we'll see everybody. Go ahead.